Hey guys, so for today's video I thought I might have a little bit of a ramble about my experience using PeerTube. Now just before I crack on with today's video I've decided to record at a bit of a ridiculous time, the sun's about to go down so uh, if there are any changes in lighting as the video goes on uh, that's very specifically why. The sun's always very low in the sky and it gives a very hard uh, angle of light that comes through uh, and I've tried to soften it as much as I can but it never really looks too good to record when the sun is setting but I know you guys are really here for uh, the more substantive stuff of my videos so I know that that's not going to uh, well, uh, I know that that's not going to bother you guys too much but um, but I just wanted to make this video today and I kind of had the impetus to do so um, to talk about PeerTube. Now PeerTube uh, is a, a potential uh, alternative to YouTube, but it challenges the very framework of how YouTube is put together. It challenges YouTube's uh, s sort of centralized nature and its monopoly on video sharing on the internet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros, the cons, um, whether or not PeerTube is the next YouTube killer, or whether or not it potentially can be, and a little bit, uh, and some thoughts surrounding that. This is going to be a very rambly video, and I doubt that I'm going to cover all the topic points that I want to cover. But like I said, I just kind of had that that feeling to make the video, um, this video today, and I've been uh, playing around with PeerTube now for for quite some time, actually. Um, a good number of videos have gone up, certainly since last year. And uh, my channel, of course, I will link it in the description below, uh, but it also can be found at share.tube. It's a wonderful URL. But the difference between PeerTube and YouTube and all the other um, attempted YouTube killers is that PeerTube isn't actually a website. It's not actually a platform. It's a piece of software. It's a piece of software so that um, any person capable of hosting it can then host their own video sharing website. But further to this is that peer, an instance of PeerTube, an installation of PeerTube, can then federate with other instances of PeerTube and other pieces of like federated software that work with ActivityPub. So for example, Mastodon, Miskey, Plerima, um, and all of the other um, pieces of software that can actually, um, you know, fit together in what's called the Fediverse. But uh, PeerTube is just one of these components. And um, it, you can also subscribe to videos using RSS and, um, and other uh, PeerTube accounts, or you can actually subscribe directly from, um, sub you can subscribe directly to a PeerTube account using, for example, your Mastodon account. So there's a lot of ways that uh, you can actually access PeerTube content, and it fits into an existing ecosystem really well. I think this is one of PeerTube's great strengths, because the biggest problem when you've got a, a potential YouTube killer getting off the ground is just outright viewership, right? People are not, like creators like myself, are not going to necessarily have the enthusiasm to create for a platform if not, if no one's go, going to watch it, and uh, so like the first hurdle that any potential YouTube challenger needs to have is a way to garner viewership, and it definitely seems that PeerTube has this considered in mind. Now, uh, it's certainly the case that whenever I put out any content on any platform, it has always been YouTube that where the most number of views comes from, and this is the thing: the, YouTube's monopoly is not actually. Um, strengthened by its ability to host all these videos. I mean, it does host a uh, sort of an impossible number of videos that no other competitor can hope to achieve. But then again, it doesn't have to. If you think about the majority of content, the majority of bandwidth and disk space that YouTube uses, it's likely just going to be people messing around on their mobile phones and it's going to be useless, you know, archives of live streams that hardly anyone is ever going to watch. If you actually get rid of all of the content that we can quite happily afford to lose that isn't just being used as an you know an archiving platform for data that re you know or for videos that aren't really necessarily useful or or desired and, and that we actually focus on the quality of video. So if we just want quality content, content where just some effort has gone into it, some editing has gone into it, um, then it becomes a much more manageable goal, especially if you decide that, for example, 4K 60 frames per second is not something that everyone needs. Hell, these videos that I produce, they don't really need to even be in HD. Um, so it, it it definitely seems the case that like the, um, the hurdle of bandwidth and the hurdle of disk space can be overcome. Uh, now, with PeerTube, it does use BitTorrent technology. It basically brings in the strength of BitTorrent, so all of the weight of bandwidth isn't put on the servers themselves. A popular video will then get shared around using BitTorrent, and that is 
a way to make sure that servers don't get overloaded. That is a wonderful piece of technology. And it's it's, a, it's an age-old piece of technology. We've been BitTorrenting uh, stuff, Linux distributions, for example, for goodness knows how many years. It is a you know, it's a tried and true way of getting a, a file across the internet to a lot of people really quickly and really efficiently. It's a wonderful piece of technology that, uh, you know, it, it, it's testament to its, you know, wide usage as well. So uh, it's definitely got, uh, it's uh, definitely managed to overcome some of those initial hurdles. But the trouble is, is that, like I say, YouTube's monopoly and the power of its monopoly does not come from its ability to host videos. That is just a feature. I mean, if you think about it, right, YouTube famously operates at a uh, at a loss, like at a financial loss. But why does YouTube keep putting in new features and, 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 and putting in so much development into a platform that costs it money? And the answer is actually very straightforward. If you think about it, it is because owning the monopoly on video sharing on the website is worth all of the money that Google throw at it. It's worth everything, right? And... Um, Again, we're like usually heavily advised not to talk about things like adblock, but that's one of the reasons why YouTube doesn't mind you using adblock. It turns a blind eye to it. Obviously, it would prefer that you don't, and obviously advertisers and, to some degree, content creators kind of, you know, benefit from, from uh, ads playing on our content. But YouTube itself is more than happy to take that financial loss of adblock if it brings more people onto the platform, if it's got eyeballs on their videos, because it strengthens their monopoly. And then what they can do then is that they can then apply that monopoly to an app. They can apply that monopoly to a browser. And let's face it, when it comes to browsers, there is a near monopoly on the Chrome browser as well. Uh, not to mention that it has a huge foothold in email with Gmail and, of course, search engines as well. And, and again, at the core of Google's content strategy when it comes to YouTube and other content on the Internet, uh, it, it's about discoverability. Also, I just want to take this moment to point out AMP, uh, Google's attempt to actually try and uh, monopolize mobile frameworks uh, in terms of just basic websites as well. Uh, Google really do have their claws on the internet. And of course, there's Google Recapture as well. And countless websites that claim to be an alternative to a Google product or claim to be um, you, you know, a, a rebel against Google's monopoly will employ the Google recapture to protect themselves from uh, DDoS attacks and spam and all that kind of stuff. So even the people that try and break the Google monopoly in many cases end up still running Google code on their site. And that's not even talking about Google Analytics. Uh, if you've got something like Ublo um you matrix that's the uh, that's the the add-on i'm thinking of you can actually have a look at all of the third party uh, pieces of software that are associated with any given website and you just have a look at how common across the internet google analytics really is like google really and well and truly have uh, eyeballs and claws on the internet in all kinds of um, avenues that that many of us probably haven't even imagined as of yet so they are more than happy to take financial losses if it means strengthening the actual power itself. Because who knows, 10 years down the line, when they uh, own almost every avenue to internet access, then they can actually start throwing their weight around in ways that we would find, you know, quite rightly horrific, because we have now just sealed ourselves into a corner thanks to the conveniences of Google products. So this is one of the reasons why the monopoly of YouTube is such, uh, you know, it, it's a thing to be concerned about um, uh, in terms of a threat to the, the open internet as well. So... Um, and, and Google know this, and, and this is why Google will put so much money towards protecting that monopoly. Uh, and, and, and again, this is why they have so they put a lot of money towards open source projects as well. That's why they have seats uh, in you know in, in regards to uh, on on the Linux Foundation, for example. You know they want this level of control. They want influence at all levels, all stages here as well. And you know it, it might not even go. You know they there is they are working on of course a new kernel, the the uh, Fuchsia project. So that might be their attempt to actually uh, break away from using Linux technologies, which are technologies that are. Um, ways to actually protect, you know, open development on computers and, and an open internet and all that kind of stuff. You know, they they are sort of using the famed, um, uh, what's it, what's it, uh, it um, extend, 
no, embrace, extend, extinguish. That's the one. Uh, and, and they are just trying to 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 use the old Microsoft adage that was, uh, I believe, it was original originally Microsoft that used um, embrace, extend, extinguish. The idea of uh, start using uh, technologies uh, and and start adopting them, then start using, then start implementing features that. Uh, are only then available for your particular avenue of this said open source technology add-ons that only you know proprietary add-ons on top of open source software and then extinguish to make it so that people then become reliant on those proprietary add-ons uh, or, or maybe even like reliant on Google money as well, Google funding as well, because we know that there are plenty of um, uh, institutions in the free and open source world that take Google money. And how long, you know, and it, they might not necessarily be reliant on that money now, but what happens over time? Well, you know, conferences only get more expensive over time. I, I do not work in events uh, professionally, but I certainly had a hand in them uh, in other parts of my life. And they are very expensive, only getting more expensive. There's more and more health and safety that needs to be taken into account year on year. More and more red tape, insurance, uh, you know, paramedics need to be paid. The bigger the event, the more power, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. It's all required. Uh, money is essential. There aren't ways to do a lot of these things on the cheap. So you know and um and that's not again that's not even talking about google's hand in the political world as well where they like to throw money around uh so yeah google invest in all these kind of avenues that sort of take on this spirit of extend embrace embrace extend embrace extend extinguish so anyway um how can PeerTube fight out, fight against this? Well, it does aim to bring about discoverability. So it, it sort of aims to embed itself within existing um, open internet frameworks using things like RSS, using things like the Fediverse as well. Um, and, um, and, and that's a great step. But another avenue, uh, uh, you know, and, and it can garner viewership from this way. Now, sometimes centralized platforms, I know, for example, uh, my videos are mirrored over on BitChute and my videos over on BitChute get a, a significant number of views there. And um, there are um, there are arguments to say that, well, centralized platforms, even ones that are not Google, uh, make it easier to discover um, content. And that is like, that is a fair argument to make. But you can still have like big peer tube instances that um, while at the same time, um, hosting a lot of content themselves can sort of bring in uh, content from other places as well. So you can almost, in theory, get the best of both worlds. Now, I do want to point out at, uh, at this point in the video that PeerTube is very, very, very young technology. It's very young technology. Uh, it's only recently come out of beta. And a lot of um, the, uh, the determining factors in terms of the quality of, of experience of PeerTube are also going to come down to the administ the particular instance that you're running. So some instances are going to be run uh, better than others. Some instances are going to have more resources dedicated to them than others. Another thing that people do tend to uh, criticize PeerTube instances for is that they don't tend to have very much in regards to upload allowance. So sometimes PeerTube uh, will only allow you a couple of hundred, maybe a gig in terms of how much um, you know video that you can actually upload to the site. But I've got to be honest, I in some ways consider this a feature as much as a bug because it makes us realize that you know, stuff needs to be paid for. Like, like stu you know, we can't just magic magically expect videos to be hosted for free. Like, there is a cost to having all the video content hosted on YouTube. And that cost is not necessarily, you know, um, immediate. It's like, you know, it's like prison debt where you get, you get something for free, but you know that it's going to cost you in a big, big, big way later on down the line. Um, so it's like taking something for free when you're in prison. It's like, no, it ain't, it ain't free. You're gonna, you're gonna, like you, you're gonna, you're gonna pay for that in a way that you really don't want to later on down the line. So it's, you know, it's a bit like that. But you know, m you know, maybe people just aren't that forward thinking. Maybe people aren't, uh, you know, don't feel like they have that much of a stake in it, or maybe people just don't care. Um, or maybe this is these are problems too big for most people's minds to to concern themselves with. Uh, you know, that's. But um, but definitely when it comes to, to, to PeerTube, it makes you think a little bit more about the value of disk space, the value of hosting, the fact that 
it's not free, that someone somewhere's got to pay for it. And maybe you can have Peertube instances that are funded by Patreon. Maybe you can have Peertube instances that are funded by creators actually buying or renting uh, some of the disk space. If you look at somewhere like SoundCloud, uh, there uh, you do actually have the, you know, when you upload things to SoundCloud, um, when you upload things to SoundCloud, it's very much a case of like the creator has to pay for the bandwidth and has to pay for, or actually not the bandwidth, the disk space specifically uh, to host their uh, sound content on. Uh, SoundCloud is not a, or doesn't seem to be an ad supported uh, platform in the same way that YouTube is. Like if I wanted to upload the audio content um, from these videos onto, um, onto SoundCloud, uh, it would actually cost me um, substantially more than hosting it on, on YouTube. So that is uh, something to be taken into account there that, um, that yeah, like disk space has a, has a genuine value. And um, if you're not paying for it, someone somewhere is, and that's something that needs to be, you know, sort of recognized, I think. So, uh, you know, and I, I don't necessarily have a problem with creators having to foot the bill on this one, uh, because, you know, it, it means that, you know, we can then assess our content, It's we can assess its value. I mean, some people might make the argument that maybe content that goes up on the internet, particularly uh, video content or anything like that, shouldn't necessarily uh, have its survival depend on whether or not it's, um, you know, fiscally profitable. And that's a whole different complex argument in and of itself. But, uh, but the thing is, is that there's no such thing as a free lunch, which kind of means that... Um, that Peertube forces users and forces creators to recognize the value of the services that they're providing, the value of the hardware that is being provided, the value of hosting. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's definitely um, some aspects on, on, on Peertube in that regard. However, so one area where YouTube does succeed and where Peertube is still very much catching up is in discoverability. The fact of the matter is you think of a video, you doesn't even have to, to, to immediately have any relevance to the internet. But if you want to look for a video, uh, your immediate port of call is, is YouTube. Like you, there, there is not a Peertube, there is not a place on Peertube. You can't even, you can't search all of Peertube instances. You can, there is, you know, federated networks and things like that. You could even use regular search engines and things like that. But uh, in reality, discoverability is a hurdle that I feel that Peertube still needs to overcome. And may, it may well do, like it's still software that is being uh, thoroughly developed uh, as this video goes out. So that is worth bearing in mind. But discovering video content on YouTube, that's where the real power of YouTube lies, discoverability. And it makes a lot of sense if you look at Google's origins. Uh, Google's origins, of course, being the search engine, the search engine that was simple, straightforward, to a degree minimalist. And uh, it got, you know, they focused on getting the quality, uh, quality results. And yeah, you know, maybe part of those quality results are the fact that it uses a lot of information about you to determine things that you might be interested in or, or content that you might uh, specifically want to look at. And if they apply this to YouTube, which I assume they do, um, and I, or, you know, which is quite obvious that they do, uh, then it can, uh, then yeah, they can um, find a lot of entertaining content that would, would meet a lot of people's um, requests in, in that regard. So yeah, YouTube's strength is not necessarily hosting its own content. Like for example, you know, if we did take away all of the content that we could quite happily live without, it's not uh, unfathomable to think that uh, non-YouTube companies and that community-based organizations could take a lot of that, um, a lot of that, that uh, load there. But um, so, so discoverability is definitely something that YouTube really does have uh, that, um, that the other other platforms, you know, typically do not. And um, a lot of people uh, who I know who, who are content creators, professional content creators on YouTube, uh, will hear the advice from YouTube representatives and even from their uh, channel network advisors that you should treat YouTube as a search engine. And that isn't necessarily the worst advice going. The majority of my videos are actually watched by people who are not subscribers to this channel. And it's actually kind of remarkable to think that. Um, but yeah, it is very much like I, I look at the analytics all the time and it becomes very, very, very apparent that not even by a small margin, by a significant margin, the majority of people who watch my videos are not subscribers. Um, and that means that I rely 
very heavily on YouTube and Google's algorithm to actually get my content out there in a way that it just won't happen with Peertube, that just won't happen on BitChute, or at least will happen to a much reduced degree, or any other platform that my video or my content goes up on. So that is very much the case, and especially when it comes to ad-supported content, um, you know, the number of people watching is definitely something that contributes to uh, how how much, you know, like to, to how much money money a video is going to make you and therefore, you know, uh, contributes to to bills being paid at the end of the month and all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's generally speaking, we're advised as content creators not to talk about money on YouTube. I know that that kind of stigma is being broken down now, but it is something that, that, that comes into play. And actually, that takes me on to uh, another point here that YouTube does have over almost all other platforms is monetization. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, a lot of cre creators do depend on the uh, revenue that uh, ads from YouTube um, bring in. I do, right? That's the thing. I, I Nothing would please me more than to actually uh, follow HexDSL's example and get, um, and get ads off this channel. I would absolutely love that. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, that I need I need the money. That's the, the that's the the sort of the stone cold truth of it. I've got bills to pay. I've got you know I've I've got to feed myself and and all that kind of stuff. So um, and and YouTube when it comes to um, gen you know revenue uh, you know sort of be, being a revenue stream is actually more reliable than a lot of other, especially pay what you want models. Anyway, without laboring the point too much, the um, ability to monetize videos when it comes to basically the practical day-to-day -day living um, and, and, and time management and all that kind of stuff, like it is important. I know that it's not great to talk about on here. I know that it always doesn't go down well and there's always the, the, the crowd that say, well, if you can't make it on YouTube, why don't you go and get another job and all that kind of stuff. And you know, maybe that's a discussion for another day. But it does come into, you know, it, it is an important factor. People have bills to pay. People have mouths to feed, and um, and if the uh, and the avenue um, options on YouTube actually, uh, they're kind of pretty good actually in a lot of ways. Like a lot of people, of course, despise YouTube ads, but uh, and I've even been encouraged by a lot of people to. Um, to actually try and find like industry sponsors, for example, but um, and and that's definitely something that isn't you know comp it isn't an idea I've ruled out. But I've always actually kind of liked the um, YouTube advertising model in one particular uh, capacity is that it actually distances me from the advertisers. It means I can be cr uh, completely critical of any uh, organization, any company, no matter how close to home, no matter how involved in the free and open source space it is, because the people that sell and show the adverts on YouTube are a completely different set of people to the people making the content. I have no influence whatsoever in terms of, um, in you know, in terms of the uh, the the organisations that I talk about. Um, it's a, it's it was it was a, it was hailed as a really great idea back back in the day because you'll often find on, for example, TV um, that the actual the advertising deals that they have do actually Im uh, impact on um, the overall channel in other ways. So. Um, but anyway, that's just uh, my thoughts on it, but um, uh, and certainly not complete thoughts at that. But um, it, it, I think that it is something that, um, that that I'm not necessarily saying that Peertube ought to take that idea wholesale, because uh, again, that may not necessarily be a road that we want to go down. But uh, if Peertube and Peertube instances and the overall network um, are, are going to take uh, people away from YouTube are going to break that monopoly. Um, money is going to come into play at some point down the line. So that's definitely um, that's definitely something to uh, to 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 think about anyway. So just as the sun is going down, I'm going to wrap up with my final thoughts. Uh, I don't know the intentions of the PeerTube development team. I don't know if they intend to take down the titan that is YouTube or just build a small modest community alternative to it, or whether or not they're just going to uh, build some tools for which other people can then you know, craft the video sharing landscape as they see fit. Um, but it definitely, to me, shows a significant degree of promise, providing that it, you know, carries on with a degree of momentum, because I don't see YouTube in any way being 
competed against by a like-for-like -like company. Uh, for a start, there's nothing to say that that company won't then develop the same inherent problems, the same in inherent systemic problems that we see with YouTube as a monopoly. Um, but also um, because it requires a degree of hardware and finance that uh, I, I think that Google are just too far ahead with uh, at this stage. And if there is going to be a like-for-like -like YouTube competitor, it's likely to come from an Amazon or a Microsoft or, or even an Apple. Um, probably less likely with Apple, but you never know. So, well, I mean, they do have iTunes, so there's that. But then again, iTunes is a little bit different, isn't it? It still focuses on uh, on a more decentralized uh, way of doing things. So maybe uh, maybe we might see the podcastification of video through services like Peertube, and that would be pretty, pretty excellent. Um, but also, we don't have to think of Peertube as a YouTube killer. Like, there can be several uh, models for video sharing on the internet that coexist. Uh, the idea behind Google's business model does seem to be uh, to to squash all competition, to be uh, you know the top dog, the the dominant platform, and to you know the monopoly is built into its business ethos, and and that needs to be challenged, in my opinion. But uh, that's not to say that the answer to that is smashing it to a million pieces, but rather building um, or rebuilding the open web. And, you know, online video, it definitely seems like it's here to stay, but that's not to say that we can't build it the way that we want, the way that we see fit. It's going to be a long road. It's going to be a tough road. And I think a lot of people will have some rather negative hot takes along the way, thinking that they know better than all of that. But to me... It's just a fight worth fighting. It's just something that, you know, that that, that monopoly should be challenged, that uh, we should see if uh, alternative routes are possible, that a better internet is possible, that a more open internet is possible, and whether or not it can solve the same challenges that, uh, that the Google-styled internet uh, claims to or wants to. So there's a lot of factors at play here. Uh, will Peertube be the YouTube killer? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, let's face it, anyone that's gone up against YouTube so far has not done particularly well. And maybe that's because that the not being YouTube is just not enough. Maybe it needs to be something more. Um, so... I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how this goes, but my videos will continue to be put up on ShareTube specifically. That's my PeerTube instance. And I've got to say, just on a uh, from a creator standpoint, from a user standpoint, it's really nice. It's a really pleasant experience. And, um, and uh, I'll, I'll put a link to the channel down in the description below if you guys are interested in watching my content on a different platform, on a more open platform, um, because it is... Um, you know, it, peer tubes where my heart's at, I guess, as well. So anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. That's about it from me today. And um, if you are interested, of course, these videos, these long rambly discussion videos are also available uh, for free on Patreon. Um, so you can just go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Ware and um, you can just um, play them or download them straight off the website. They're not behind a paywall or anything, but Patreon is actually a pretty good place to host MP3 files. So, you know. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. That's about it from me today. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware and you've been awesome. Take care now.